we're starting, we are recording now. Uh, welcome to our Empathy Cafe. I'm Edwin Rutsch uh, from the XR uh, Empathy Circle Work Group. And uh, this is our Empathy Cafe to explore how Extinction Rebellion can build a, a facilitator network to bring uh, Democ democracy building practices into the uh, DNA, organically bring it into the DNA of uh, XR. Last time somebody complained that it was genetic engineering, so mm. <laughs> putting in organic. Um, and this is part of uh, XR's uh, third demand, which is to create the citizens assemblies. And there's a whole series of democracy building practices needed for uh, creating those uh, uh, citizens assemblies and that's what the uh, future democracy hub is all about so i wanted to uh, give a uh, just to sh give a quick overview of what our schedule here is and uh, so we're going to start with a short participant introduction there we can just introduce themselves uh, we'll have a intro to the xr future democracy hub and facilitators network uh, we're going to review how to do an empathy circle, uh, the process, and then we'll have uh, breakout rooms for about 70 minutes or so, and we'll be going, dividing into smaller groups, and we'll be talking about how might we best build an uh, XR democracy facilitator network and any tangible uh, steps you'd like to take. And then we'll come back into the group and probably have a little bit, maybe in about the last 25 minutes or so. And uh, we'll come back and do a full group debrief. And then for anybody that can stay, we'll have a 30 minute uh, overtime uh, session for asking some more questions and getting some uh, feedback and debrief on those questions. So let's see, I see somebody messaging. The, so I wanted to uh, start with uh, short introductions. Um, uh, Bill, would you just be willing to call on people? It, uh, just so it's just your name, uh, location, any XR group you're you're part of. And sure. I'm Edwin Rutch uh, from uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm from the XR Empathy Circle uh, Work Group. Just to demonstrate how it works. Okay, and I'll introduce myself. My name is Bill Filler. Um, I'm with the Empathy Tent Group and also the XR Facilitators Group. I'm also in the San Francisco Bay Area. Sophia? I am, uh, my name is Sophia and uh, I'm from Sweden, Mamo, and I'm a regular participant in, uh, in the Empathy Cafes that Edwin holds. Lou? Uh, I'm Lou Zwire. I'm also from Northern California in the USA and um, part of Edwin's Empathy Tent group. And I've done a bunch of the XR Empathy Cafes and Facilitator um, support group. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, correct me if I pronounce your name wrong, but Alcides? Uh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, no, okay, I'll see this. Yeah, I'll see, uh, okay. I'll see this. Okay. Um, from XR Porto, Portugal, and also uh, the Degrowth Net. Um, I live in Portugal. Great, great. Welcome. Uh, Carolina? Uh, my name is Carolina. You can call me Carl Caro. Uh, I'm calling from Central Europe, uh, city of Gdańsk in north, north of Poland. Uh, I am a member of local XR group, but I am also a member of uh, Empathy Circle work group and uh, international support team region group. That's me. Okay. Uh, David? Hi, David Baum from Seattle, Washington, on the West Coast of the United States. I am new here. Thank you for welcoming me, Edwin, and everyone. 
I am, um, my primary uh, place of uh, uh, allegiance is mm -hmm. deep adaptation. That's where I come from. Um, there is most recently a new online group called XR Deep Adaptation. Mm -hmm. I named Andre S. Clements from South Africa. He's on the IST down there. Mm -hmm. um, started it, and uh, I am uh, uh, Deep Adaptation does uses this tool, and I'm here to learn what you're doing with this tool. This tool being the Zoom online meetings. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Welcome, uh, Marta. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Marta, originally from Portugal, but now living in uh, Cork in Ireland, part of XR here, uh, and also part of the Empathy Cycle Work Group. Great, thanks. Uh, and then I see Annika. Hi, I'm Annika. I'm from Denmark, um, and I'm part of the Regenerative Culture Working Group in Copenhagen. So yeah, Great. hi from Copenhagen. Um, unfortunately, I can only stay for another 20 minutes, but I will make sure to get the recording afterwards. Thank you. Great. Yeah, welcome. All right, Steve. Hi, it's Steve Buckley. I'm in the East Coast US, uh, New England area, and I am a member of the uh, US chapter of the International Association for Public Participation. And in a previous life, I work for the federal government in public engagement. Great, welcome Steve, good to have you. Okay, and then I see Sally just joined us. Sally, you wanna just quickly introduce yourself and let us know what kind of XR groups you might be involved in? Sally, can you hear me? Okay, I don't know if Sally can hear me. All right, um, in a true nod to uh, artificial intelligence, Mary's iPad is there. Uh, either Mary or her iPad, could you respond, please? Or introduce yourself. <laughs> Mary? All right. Okay. Well, Mary and her iPad are both welcome here. Um, so, okay. Uh, that's it. I don't know. I'll do one more try. Sally, can you hear us? Okay. So I think that Mary and Sally uh, can't hear us uh, for some reason. Okay, Edwin, okay. I'll toss yeah. it back to you. Thanks, anyway, we should, uh, not, uh, we should uh, admit that we recording this. this oh meeting. yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. This is being recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, it's not the place to be. So, um, and also we keep posting here. Every time people arrive, they, they don't see the previous uh, stuff in the chat window. So it's just the link to our online uh, working page. And you can go in and add your contact info there. So let's go next into a quick introduction into the uh, XR Future Democracy Hub. And let's see. I'm going to just show the site. So if you go to xrdemocracy.uk, you'll come up to the Future Democracy Hub website. And this is a, a resource for different democracy building practices. And they have the three principles, uh, radical inclusivity, trust, and active listening. And what we're doing here in the empathy circle is really about active listening. It's really giving some tools for doing uh, effective active listening and being able to facilitate a, a, an active listening or empathic listening, which we just use interchangeably uh, s dialogue. And it goes into just explaining, you know, why this uh, hub has been created. And there's various uh, resources. You can join the online community and that's on Lumio. And I'll just show if you click through, you'll get to the Future Democracy Hub for the Future Democracy Hub happens. Uh, there's links to the training events. And I'll show more about that later. There's other kind of resources. And then so the meat of the, of the site is it's a, it's a gateway to different future democracy uh, tools for going from sort of ease of use to kind of more complex processes. So there is a list of the different processes here. There's Talk Shop, which is a sort of a simple topic uh, process for having dialogue. 
there is a simple empathy circle process, which you're going to be doing and learning and practicing and deepening your skills uh, today. There's uh, people's assemblies, there's uh, thinking box, there's flat pack democracy, and then the citizens action network and citizens assemblies, which uh, we'd mentioned that's the uh, third demand in XR to uh, that the, we take that the government support these to make a decision around uh, climate change, what actions to take. And so, is you, so these is again go from easier to more complex and the empathy circle is a fairly, very easy uh, sort of first step gateway practice that uh, I find very effective. Um, you can also go to the Future Democracy Hub uh, Facebook page and you can see the different events that are coming up online. So that's this event here. We have next week, we are having an empathy cafe on how XR might more effectively mediate conflict, which is really part of democracy is how do you get people, you know, talking to each other and resolving conflicts and taking shared action. There's been this month, there's been quite a few different, uh, different courses or and if you're a facilitator, you can work through here and, and you know, get your, your course uh, or class or workshop listed and everything from how to reach consent to taking power at the local level, growing democracy, et cetera. So there's been quite a few events in here. So that's, let me stop the sharing. I think that's it for, yeah. Oh, and then you can also uh, uh, see, it's our work group. You can see, you can find the links here in our in the event page. You can go through to the our Empathy Circle work group if you're interested in learning more about the uh, Empathy Circles. So I'll stop there. And let's see. Next, we'll go into the uh, review of how to do an Empathy Circle. And Lou's going to give a explanation of that. And I'm going to be dividing people into I think one, two, three. How many groups should we do? Maybe do two, two one person is going to be leaving, so I'll be creating, I guess, two groups. Uh, yeah. So anyway, if you want to explain how to take part in the empathy circle, Lou, and I will sure. be doing the breakout rooms. Sure. <clears throat> so um, the empathy empathy circle process. Um, the purpose of it is to um, have a chance to s talk about think whatever's important to you, say what's important to you, and to be heard, and to know that you've been heard to that, to be heard to your satisfaction, uh, and to um, understand others uh, by listening to them. So it's a, it's a way of being heard and hearing others, a way of creating connection, and a way of creating mutual understanding. Um, and the process uh, works like this. You do it in uh, typically in a group of four people with a facilitator. Could be a little bit more, could be a little fewer, but um, four, four with a facilitator is an excellent, an excellent number. Uh, and uh, what happens in the circle is um, timed term taking. So someone, be someone becomes the speaker. And they get, in, in most cases, you have time tricking, turn taking. Sometimes you don't, but most of the time you do. Uh, and I think we're going to do probably three or four minute turns. And when it's your turn to speak, you say what is on your mind. There might be a topic for the circle, or it might be no topic. Uh, Anyway, when it's your time to speak, you can speak about it, whatever you want. That's one of the rules of the circle is even if there's a topic, when it's your turn to speak, you should speak about what's important to you at that moment, whatever comes up in you, um, and you're free to do that. You don't have to stay on the topic. Uh, and that it's important actually for you to talk about whatever's important to you in the moment, because that's really what keeps the conversation meaningful and alive. When you're speaking or before you start speaking, the speaker will select someone else in the circle to reflect back what they're saying. So you have the speaker and you have what's called the active listener or the reflector. And then the other people in the circle are also listening to the speaker, but they're listening silently. And as the speaker speaks, you pause, you know, maybe after you've expressed it, a, an idea or two, uh, you pause so that the reflector can reflect it back. 
if you don't pause, the reflector may say, can you pause please so I can reflect back because I can't really hold that much. Or if the reflector doesn't do that, the facilitator might do that because often people are shy about asking the speaker to stop. Um, and so that, that's one of the roles that the facilitator will do is to ask the speaker to stop um, so that the reflector can reflect. So then the reflector reflects back, you know, in their own words, or maybe they use the words, the actual words that the person has said. They reflect back the essence of what they understand the person is saying, both, both the meaning of it and the feelings that are expressed or implied. Um, and then you check. And if the person uh, feels heard, they can say so. If they, if part of it was heard, but part not, they can say that, yeah, you got this, but you know, you, I wanna be understood for this part that you missed. Anyway, so that exchange, that kind of exchange goes on the speaking and the reflecting until the time is up. Uh, and the, the facilitator will, has a you know, clock or something like that, they keep time. And when the time is up, it can either be a visual signal or the timer goes off on the timer and you hear it as an audio signal. Uh, when the time signal is given, the speaker doesn't have to stop instantly, you know, just take it as a cue to wrap up what you're saying and um and get your last reflection um and you don't have to take all your time so if you have three or four minutes to speak that's the upper limit of your time but if you don't have that much to say you don't have to speak the whole time when it when your turn is done if you feel you know if, if you feel heard you can say thank you i feel heard and then your turn at the speak the speaker's turn is over and the reflector the person who's been doing the reflection, they become the speaker now, and it's their turn for, for whatever number of minutes. And they, they select a different person in the circle to be the reflector. And, uh, and, the, and the process keeps going. So the speaker picks a different reflector each time. So the, the speaking and the listening goes around the circle. Uh, and when you, make, when you complete one, uh, uh, circuit, everyone's had a chance, you just go again, you keep going. And uh, let's see, and that's basically the way it goes. The role, the role of the facilitator does a few things. So the facilitator might ask people to introduce themselves at the beginning of the process. If people don't know each other, the facilitator might ask if people have any questions about the process before you begin. The facilitator will uh, ask the speaker to pause if they don't do that. The speaker may say something to the reflector, like sometimes maybe the reflector might be responding to the person who's speaking, giving their opinion or, or asking a question or doing something other than reflecting back what they're hearing. And if that happens, then the, the, the um, facilitator may interrupt and say, you know, excuse me, you know, when it's your turn, you can ask questions or you can respond, say whatever you want. But right now your role is reflector and you just please reflect back what you're hearing the person say. And if they're having trouble doing that, the, um, the, the uh, facilitator, you know, may do that as a way of exam by example. Or sometimes the speaker might have to say it again, you know, if the, if the reflector can't remember what was said. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say is that if in this process as a reflector, a listener, if you have questions or, or uh, you can write those down, if you have things that you're wanting to say <laughs> instead of reflecting, you can write those down and when it's your turn to speak, you know, you, then you can ask those questions or you can say whatever you need to say. So I think that's the essence of it. Does anyone have any questions about it? Yeah, the best way is just to do it and you just observe because you have experienced people here so you'll be able to see. Uh, so in the first group, uh, Martha will facilitate and then the second one, Lou, and we have experienced people in, in both groups. And I'm putting the link in for a shared Google Doc and you'll see if you, you'll see there's a kind of a note take up. Is that, is that not working? Did it kind of blow up?
Oh, well, anyway, it was working that link to that uh, document. Somehow it's not showing up here. Maybe it'll start. But anyway, in that document, you can take notes. You'll see uh, uh, group one with, um, with uh, Martha and group two with Lou. So we're going to go into the circles and uh, what do you think, maybe four minutes. Uh, turns for uh, naps working. Uh, so let's uh, open all the rooms and we can get uh, started. Uh, so I'm sorry, Edwin, I wasn't listening. Did you just say when we'd be coming back? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think we can give it about uh, 25 till we'll be coming back. So that gives us uh, about 75 minutes or so. Okay. All right. Okay, thanks for asking about that. Um, open all the rooms so you'll can we a second we have one more person oh we do oh I'll send John. Uh, and we recording we recording that's important information for you okay Hello. Okay, this is our group. I might be shifting people around to me. Oh. There's enough people for us to come to groups. Yeah, let me put one person in the other. Somebody didn't join the other group, move to group two. So I was talking to Mary there from the iPad and she um, she's in Santa Fe, but she was struggling with the sound. She couldn't hear us. Oh, uh -huh. So she was going to try and get another headset. Yeah. Okay, so it might be good if someone starts and speaks to you, Martha. Huh, to... Yeah, would you like me to record or are you re oh, recording? Oh, I'm already? recording. This is recording. Good. Okay. And we're doing four minutes, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So whoever would like to start, I'm happy to be your listener. Uh, what's the topic? Oh, <laughs> our topic is on the uh, how do we create a facilitators network or whatever is alive for you? It's a XR facilitators network. Oh, okay. Or it can be whatever is alive for you. And maybe David or Anika would like to start and you can speak to Martha and she can demonstrate the, the listening. I'd love to start, but unfortunately I have to go in one minute. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna check out the recordings later. I'm going to an XR thing now. <laughs> it's evening for us, so we're actually meeting now. So unfortunately cannot stay, but thank you. Hope you have a good I'll go if that would be useful. Great. So I am speaking to you, Marta. You are my designated reflector. Is that right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Cool. <clears throat> and I have four minutes? Yes. Okay. So you don't need to worry about that. I'll let you know when it comes up. Thank you. First of all, again, thank you for welcoming me. Um, this is very interesting because it, uh, it parallels a question that faces the deep adaptation network. We do online Zoom calls as well under the title uh, deep listening. Mm. Uh, and it is less well defined than this is. And I'm very attracted to the fact that you all have a very well defined method with a video, which I watched, uh, describing 
how it works, that's a very valuable resource. The principle is the same though, that people need to be heard completely. So I'll, I'll, I'll just stop you there if that's okay. Um, <laughs> so you, first of all, you, you're happy you know, to be here and to be welcomed here. Um, and uh, you were saying how you find it interesting coming from this uh, deep adaptation group where you also have Zoom calls and there's also this intention of uh, listening. And you were saying that, you know, just the way you're doing it there, it's not as well defined, not so clear. And so you appreciate there being a video with very uh, with clear guidance on, on you know how to go about doing it. Yes, that's and it's correct. important. For, yeah, you, you were also acknowledging it's important for you know for people to be listened. That there's a need for that. Yes, and in that context, a lot of it is about people's feelings, uh, and I get the impression just off the bat that this group is aiming at a tool for conflict resolution and decision making. And so th the meeting of those two things of emotional expression and connection and conflict resolution and decision making, I think potentially that is a fertile intersection and so that's one of the reasons I'm here. So you're saying, if that's okay, <laughs> that you, yeah, it, it's, that mostly that in those calls, it's very often about feelings, about the emotional layer. Uh, and that it seems to you so far that you here it's a bit about also uh, the thinking part of it, the, um, the methods of uh, communicating ideas and communicating um, and conflict re resolution and, and other things as well. And so it seems like bringing those things together is the fertile uh, ground. I think so. And sort of finally for me on this initial round, I guess, is that I would say, uh, for me, the, the great thing about Zoom and this process is simply meeting people from all over the world with all kinds of approaches and backgrounds and ideas and wisdom. So it has saved my life in this phase of my life to be able to reach out and be reached out to through this extraordinary tool, this facility that somehow appeared and is now being used to bring people together across the world in the face of our dire predicament. Hmm. So yeah, so there's a lot of appreciation and um... And some, some joy there seems in, in having found this community of people they, all over the place and with different backgrounds and different cultures and having found a uh, community in, in the midst of all of this and when it's so needed and you feel that, you feel grateful for that yourself. Yeah. So true, so true. Thank you, David. We, we can go for five minutes because the group's only four, so. I was thinking. Okay, it, it it's it's been five, but I'm I'm very um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? We've got a practice of um, saying, David. I'll just mention this. Is you'll see it. Sometimes we say, "I feel heard," or you know, somehow. But it doesn't. It, it can't be anything else. Just to so that the other person feels reassured. But, um, I feel like I've had a. A nice chance to introduce myself, and uh, I feel like you heard me. Thank you. Um, Sophia, would you be my listener, please? Oh, 
I'm not muted. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I feel appreciation too and um, curiosity as well because there's people here today that are from, you know, deep adaptation and from other movements and as I've been in XR and reading about the other ones but not really meeting people from them uh, on, on calls, it's, it's exciting. <laughs> So you're feeling appreciation and also curiosity and excitement because uh, you're, um, yeah, you feel excited about meeting all kinds of people from different countries that, yeah, yeah, you're excited yeah. about that. Yeah. Also that, you know, there was Alcides uh, there, because I'm from Portugal, so he's in an XR group in Portugal. And now I see Ethan and Bob coming up, and I know he's in Dublin in Ireland. Uh, so, you know, that's, it's, even if I just think some months back, uh, where we were then and where we are now, it's, it seems like it's growing. There's this sense something's growing. Yeah. So, so, um, so a person came in here that you know is from Ireland and um, uh, David is from Port Portugal and uh, you have noticed this movement expanding since just a couple of months ago and yeah you seem very excited about that yeah yeah it was Alcides in the other group not David but oh, he, sorry. but it's <laughs> Uh, and um, so thinking of this future democracy, it, I'm thinking that I've learned the empathy circle method, and I think it's great and it has lots of applications. But I'd also like to learn about other ways of facilitating meetings, because, you know, I'm in the activist group here and helping facilitate meetings here in person. And I find, and we've done people's assemblies as well, but I find we've, there's some tool missing that actually lets us brainstorm ideas together where, you know, we hear each other like we do here, but where we have a plan of getting somewhere beyond the mutual understanding, you know, where, where we plan things. Yeah. So, so you really enjoy uh, this, this format of empathy circle, but you feel that there's something missing. Uh, and especially when it comes to facilitating people and brainstorming and actually coming up with a solution, it sounds like a plan what should we do uh, beyond the the mutual understanding which you think is good but you all yeah there, there mm. seems to be uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a per, there's a particular method um i've read on called um convergent facilitation uh, by mickey kashtan and there's this other called drag and dreaming. I mean, it doesn't really matter the names, but there's these methods that seem to be, you know, that people have already developed that help people that are different and have different objectives to have some form of structured brainstorming that throughout a day, on one hand, they meet each other more and learn about each other and what they might want, but also they come up with a plan at the end of the day of doing something they might not meet all of their needs but tries to meet some of the most common needs something mm. like that so so yeah. you you you've read about other methods that seems to have some structural uh, uh brainstorming where you actually uh try uh, come up with uh, solutions in the in the end that doesn't mean all all needs of the people 
but but most of the needs it sounds like is that correct yeah 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 that's it thank you Cecilia I thank you go ahead could you repeat the names of those methods that you've heard about the planning methods please yeah I'll, I'll do that after thank you uh, Edwin mm -hmm. listening just feeling uh, very um, uh, con conscious what was it that called self-conscious mm -hmm. Because um, my face is so big on the screen, and I, I yeah. yeah. So you're feeling really self-conscious because you're noticing your face is so large or big on the screen. Yeah, you usually don't see yourself when you're talking to people. So yeah, I'm just noticing that. Yeah. yeah. So usually you maybe you see it in the different squares, and it like, sounds like you're just seeing your your face on full screen. Yeah. Exactly. Um, thoughts about what Martha uh, was talking about, uh, just coming up with a strategy. Strategy. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure if she's familiar with uh, nonviolent communication, but I think she has heard of it. Yeah. Um, but that actually. Um, in my opinion, it goes a little bit deeper. Um, sometimes it's enough to solve something just by listening and both being heard. But some, sometimes there's deeper under, underlying needs and also values that I think needs to be addressed and, and people need to have share, some kind of shared values and, and, and um, uh, yeah, that that value had, that there needs to be a, a sort of like base of of shared values. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of building on what Martha says about sort of a next step, uh, besides just the empathic listening, and you're you're pointing out about uh, NBC processes that there's some kind of a next step with NBC that you can go into the deeper feelings and the deeper uh, needs and then the values and the values create a sense of uh, connection or shared some kind of a shared experience. Yeah, because oftentimes people get stuck on, okay, let's do this. Uh, they come up with a strategy and they say, let's do this. But that may collide with the needs and values of some people. Mm -hmm. And just by knowing what the values and needs are uh, from people, you can actually start brainstorming um, with other solutions to, to come up with a strategy that meets uh, most of the people's needs. Okay, so you're you're just identifying that when people really have a shared value and they have that foundational value, that from that point they can start designing strategies that address everyone's needs. But it's kind of built on this shared uh, value, and you got to kind of get to that shared value to start with. Yeah, and, and just to get and make an example of that, I had a conflict, not a conflict, but misunderstanding with a friend. And we sat down and we um, listened to each other and heard what the need of both, both of us were. And he was always late. And that was making me really irritated. Uh, so his need was to have some flexibility in in when he was coming and my need was to have uh, predictability um, so the solution we came up with was okay so you you show up between five and a quarter to five as long as you come in this within this time I have my predictability and you have your flexibility. And that worked out great. We were both satisfied with that and mm. it, it worked. Yeah, it has worked. 
Yeah, so you, you're giving an example of how that works. You kind of identified the underlying sort of need that you had you for uh, uh, consistency or, and, and then the other one was for flexibility. And then you, when you had that a clarity about that, then you could come up with the strategy of the work. And it was a creating sort of, instead of a fixed time, you created a window that it would happen within that. So you had your your consistency within that window and he had his, the other person had their flexibility. So both needs were that's, sort of addressed with that yeah, strategy. And, and I think that's harder when it's a larger group. But that, that uh, I think it's harder to meet everybody everybody's needs. But just knowing what, what their needs and what their values are, because I think that when working with, XR, it's, it's a lot about what, what, what values people have uh, that conflict. Uh, I don't know, I'm just thinking that that's, that could be the issue. Um, mm. But, but um, yeah, I, I, I think when, 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 when you're stuck, you really have to go down to that level. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, so, oh, oh sorry, there's some more. Uh, yeah, um, because if if you don't go down to that level, you get stuck on the strategies. So my strategy was okay. You have to just make efforts to come on time, and he tried and he failed a couple of times, and that would just create a um, unnecessary struggle to for both both of us. Okay, so it was. Uh... You can see that with two people kind of working it out, but it's like if you have a whole bunch of people, like it might be more difficult to kind of find out everybody's uh, needs and be able to work out strategies. Uh, but it, you do have an example of how it did work with two people, at least. Yeah, and, and, and not to get stuck. Um, oh, and not to get stuck. So there's that quality of people yeah. getting stuck there if yeah. they're just trying their different strategies. But if they get yeah. down to the needs, you can kind of unstuck, unstick, yeah. get unstuck and move forward. Exactly. Sort of. You can brainstorm more uh, if, you, if you, you find out what the needs are. Okay. Yeah. You feel hurt? Okay. So, yeah, you can kind of find solutions. So I'll speak to uh, David then. Um, uh, you're muted. Just a note. Oh. So, yeah, I, I like the, that uh, Martha brought up, you know, sort of what's the next step? You know, if we have the empathy circle and I see it as like a first good first step that needs to be well developed, you know, to have a bunch of tools for this first step. But it is only a first step in gateway to a lot of other practices is how I see it. So you you. It, you, you look at empathy circles as a first step. Uh, there are steps beyond, but uh, you need to establish something solid and workable so you can take a first step you're confident in. And you're yeah. glad to hear that Marta yeah. brought it up. Yeah, and it's a foundation. So I see it as a foundation. So with this foundation, you can go into like what Sophia is saying with NVC. It's really this empathic listening is a first step to that whole you know, going deeper. So that's one direction. Even uh, citizens assemblies, I think empathy circles could be used as a first step in citizens assemblies, where you start, instead of just meeting with people in small groups, you meet and you do empathy circles with each, with each other so that the loud people don't sort of dominate, you know, so everyone gets heard. So I think it would bring more more equality into a people's assembly. So, sorry, you look at this as a foundation, and earlier you also used the word gateway. Mm -hmm. uh, you see applicability in the deliberations of the citizens' assemblies uh, to make sure that people have a chance to be heard and that the louder people don't dominate. Uh, so you would you could use it to alter the small group process in, in those larger contexts. And I also have the same questions as Martha. It's like, what can we do to, to do brainstorming and to harvest that and then uh, create plans or you have that decision making? So that's another you know, process which you brought up too. 
It's like, how do we do that? And one practice, uh, another one besides the convergent facilitation, I think that she mentioned, another process is called dynamic facilitation, or it's also called empathic inquiry, uh, where that process actually starts with empathy circles and then the facilitator uh, just opens the floor and anybody can kind of brainstorm and the facilitator writes all the ideas on a board and sorts them while, while you're going. So you have problems, solutions, which would be kind of strategies, uh, and then kind of data. And so the, the brainstorming is sort of sorted already. So, and again, it's the empathy circle that's sort of the gateway to, to that practice. So you're talking about the next steps as brainstorming and harvesting, uh, and there's a method of, of letting people brainstorm. You use the empathy circle as a foundation, then you allow brainstorming and you have someone who is writing it down, sorting and harvesting. And the facilitator who's doing the listening and the sorting, they're actually doing empathic listening. So as people in the group say, oh, I think this is a really terrible idea, you know, they say, okay, I'm hearing you think it's a terrible idea, and they write down terrible idea. It's like, well, I think uh, we should go do this, okay? You're saying you go do this, and as a solution, you know, there's a problem, here's the solution. So they actually, as a facilitator, do empathic listening. So everyone sort of sees their idea reflected verbally by the facilitator, as well as sees it reflected on the, on the board. And then the facilitator takes all that stuff after the event and sorts it and organizes it into a full report. So, so the facilitator plays a couple of roles. Uh, the important one you mentioned is to be an empathic listener to ensure that the, the brainstormers see that their ideas, their ideas have been heard. And then later the facilitator takes those ideas and sorts or fashions them into a report or a harvest. The thing is, is those processes, she likes three days for doing that, three eight hour days, because it takes about two days just for all the stuff to kind of come out. And it's not until, and I've noticed this too, until the third day of these processes that you really start getting into deeper, you know, processes. And that's a huge commitment. And I'd love to see if we could you know, get Rosa, who does, a friend of mine, who does this process, maybe do some of these online, would, yeah. So it's a long process and you have to warm up, you have to get through the layers, you have to get all the stuff on the table, and then sort of toward the end of a substantial commitment of time, then you start to see the fruits of what, of the process. Mm -hmm. And then after all that, it's a huge job for the facilitator to actually write all this down. So there's huge, you know, time, energy, commitment. So, but there is so many different processes. And I do think that what we're doing here is sort of a, a foundational trust building, sort of a gateway. And that's, I feel heard. Do I do a final wrap up? Yeah, if you just wrap, final wrap up. And then. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. It all rests, though, on the foundation of hearing each other, and that's what we're doing here. Is it now my, my turn again? I don't know how it works. Yeah, you just, you just pick someone. doesn't matter who. Um, David and we just I see. And then process question. We do this until our time is up. Is that right? It goes round and round and round. Well, how cool is that? <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I'll go back to Edwin. Okay, listening. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out where to begin. What you say is very interesting. And the contrast that you mentioned between, well, it's not, there's so much work for the facilitator. And the question becomes at a certain point, I'm sorry about that, I should turn off, I won't take the time. Um, question is, who are those people? Are there enough of them? Is it fair to demand their work and sacrifice? Uh, are there really enough to handle the load? And this is a question that 
my group is, is trying to face. So it brings up for me the question, what method can be truly viral that you can, and I think this method is, is, is quite close to being truly viral, where you just explain it, demonstrate it, and then other people can simply do it. But does that leave you stuck on the first step? And is that even a problem? Maybe that's okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you and your group are looking at just sort of all the dynamics of setting this up and the demands on the facilitator and the demands on the participants and just have a lot of questions about that. And you're really looking for something that can go viral, really get spread widely. And you're seeing that this is, you know, a process that's very easy and could go viral. But then you're wondering if you get kind of like stuck on this first level and is, you know, is there something else sort of needed? And I think mapping out the way, the route from the first step to subsequent steps is a service that people like us can try to learn to provide. The issue that you, XR, this group is dealing with is how do we use this tool to facilitate democratic decision making? if I've heard correctly, that's sort of the topic of how, how you are gonna do that within you. Over a deep adaptation, it's again about feelings and about how do you help people cope with the fear and disorientation that comes with realizing the dreadful situation that we're in. But in both cases, there's like, okay, you get people talking to each other, they have talked to each other, That's a good goal in and of itself, but where do you then point them? What's the route? What's the way, the map? Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that uh, like the deep adaptation process is really about sort of the emotional aspect of it. And we're, what we're looking at here is uh, sort of the gateway to the democratic processes. And then you're kind of looking at uh, maybe creating a, a map, that we could create a, a map or a pathway of here, a series of steps you can take and just kind of supporting people with that maybe clarity. And and yes, yes. And I, I have just, just a flash of like, oh, there's actually a possibly a map, a drawn thing with concepts and little nice cartoons. And, you got to be careful though, because you want it to remain available, spontaneous, malleable, personal, because you do it one way, I do it another, people do it their own way, and that's good. And yet there is some level of method, process, rigor that you do want to pass on. And yet, don't we, haven't we seen that talking circles are one of the most ancient ways that humans relate? So maybe it's not really such a big deal. It's like we figure out how to do it. Maybe everyone knows how to do it already. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you don't want to be too structured about it and keep some sort of flexibility to it. But just seeing that people already inherently sort of know how to do this dialogue at some level because these talking circles have been around for, you know, ever basically. So it's kind of like tapping into this deeper human capacity. I think it's a reclaiming, like what you said, tapping in. Uh, it's a reclaiming of our normal human connectedness from which we have been alienated by a sick culture. So it's a positive vision of reclaiming mm -hmm. our power. Yeah, so this uh, being able to dialogue deeply with each other is sort of a, a reclaiming of this capacity which we've had, have naturally, which has maybe been blocked and so forth. And there's a power to it, there's an underlying power. I feel heard. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, and speak to uh, Sophia. And yeah.
So I'll start with, in terms of if you're seeing only yourself, you can check the uh, speaker view up above. You can so you can see four people at the upper right hand corner. It says speaker view if you're oh. kind of locked into. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing all four, but okay. it's my face that is bugging me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I had some thoughts and I forgot them now. I hate, <laughs> I got so deep into what David was saying, I kind of, I kind of lost those thoughts. Um, oh, about the viral, that I do think that empathy circles can go viral and that you get a lot of benefits for the minimal amount of work. You know, there's, there's just, it's, it, it, it's like you can do a lot with, it's the, you know, the deep adaptation or whatever it was, the groups that he was talking about. Emotionally, I mean, you can really tap into deep emotions. And yesterday we had an empathy circle where you were sharing some really deep feelings. And so it does really handle that aspect as well. Yeah, so, so you believe that these em empathy circles can actually really go vir viral. And you also see the potential in, in um, exploring deeper stuff with these empathy circles, with the, the, the example of yesterday where, um, yeah, we shared some emotional stuff. And, so. and there's also the conflict resolution. It's... Uh, you know, I, if, if you can get people who are in conflict just to do empathy circles, it might take two, three, four, five, six hours, but it really just unwinds the, the you know, the issue. It, you know, it takes time, but it does eventually unwind. And you know, I've done empathy circles with my family for four or five hours, you know, so um, it does. And so that's just a quick thing you can do. So with, so the minimal, and then you can add other you know, tools like there's restorative circles, which is another process that kind of expands on the basic empathy circle. And there's a lot an NVC kind of tools. So, but again, it seems to me it's this foundational sort of practice. Yeah, so, so you, you again, I see the, the, the potential of, it seems like the simplicity of just using this tool uh, can actually solve, as uh, you mentioned, family issues. Uh, it takes time, but it, it, it's so simple. And in addition to that, you can also use other tools, but you, you see a lot of potential in, in just using this tool, it sounds like. Yeah, and I think it's underappreciated that if a family does, if or, or a group does, empathy, does empathic listening with each other, just as sort of a core practice before you have problems, that it, it kind of heads off a lot of problems to begin with. So I would love to see empathy circles as a core XR practice that it's like, oh, everybody kind of learned this practice and there's an agreement that if there is a conflict, that we will just take it into an empathy circle. So you can already have that agreement up front, plus have the practice in advance. Yeah. So so it sounds like you 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 believe that uh, doing an empathy circle before there is problems, maybe regularly, and then have an agreement to. When there is a conflict, you just do go into the empathy circle. So, so yeah, it sounds like uh, agreements mm -hmm. are, are important. Yeah, and the other part is like how to spread it because it's not like spreading like wildfire. It's like there's sort of a resistance to, yeah, I don't know if I really want to do this. It's not like catching on, and I'm not sure how to, you know, we have some people taking part, you know, it, it, but it's not having that viral effect. I'm wondering how to have that viral aspect. And I think the next step is to do this empathic uh, direct action where we set up in a public square, we sort of occupy it and offer empathic listening to the community and then also have empathy circles. And it'd be one of the demands that we want the people in power, be it the government officials, to take part in empathy circles. Like, we're not leaving here until you have an empathy circle with us about uh, the climate 
issue and polarization. There's polarization, we can't solve this problem, you know, with the left, right, polarization, got it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to overcome that. So that's just kind of a, and getting that out in public is uh, yeah. Yeah, so, through, yeah. Yeah, so, so you see that there is some, some resistance to uh, doing uh, the, these empathy, empathy circles. You don't see the spread that you want. And, and one idea that you have is just occupying a square and offering people empathy and doing empathy circles and then taking it a step further to um, sort of like we don't leave here until you politicians do empathy with us and and deal with it the the larger issues i feel fully heard thank you thank you martha it's Sophia. It's uh, a little hard for me to kind of relate to this because it, it's been a long time that I've uh, been part of a group outside of this group um, where this has uh, the, the, the conflict solving has been necessary. Yeah, I'll stop there. Mm. Yeah, in, in a way it feels a bit hard to relate in a sense because um, it's been a while apart from this group, this thing of being in a group where conflict is actually something that comes up. Yeah, um, and, and I want to just uh, empathize, em empathize, em emphasize what David and Edwin said about this process takes time, and maybe that's why people feel resistant to it. We live in a culture when, where everybody ha everything has to go fast. And listening to another person and really, really listening and resolving conflicts at a deeper level, that, that takes time. That's my experience. You, um, and, and I think you have to have that in mind when you do this kind of work. So yeah, you're emphasizing uh, what Edwin and, and David had said about this process taking time and not, you know, with the rush, rush worlds that we're living in, there's people don't always take that time to actually slow down and and deal with conflict and, and just do the process. Yeah, because it's it's often very shallow solutions that comes up when, when it is done fast. Um, and I don't really know how to um, sort of make people understand this, that really communicating with others uh, and listening and, and hearing them, take, take, that takes time. Um, uh, yeah. So given that it's, it's a, a shallow, that you know, we often just communicate at a very shallow level and you're wondering how how to communicate with people that you know that to go deeper that you need time yeah and and i i can also imagine that with you being in in the xr there are people coming in with different kind of um, energy levels as some people are the fast working people they want a solution right away uh, you're laughing, so I'm guessing that you <laughs> agree with me. And some people want to slow it down, really work it through. And I can imagine that that is a conflict also. Um, I, I think it's a, a kind of left and right brain 
uh, way of thinking. Some people just want the solution and other people, um, and I can see how that, uh, I, I see that a lot in, in society, that conflict. So you're thinking of something that you know from normal society, but you're imagining, you know, as you know, in XR and in an XR context, having people coming in from different at different energy levels and with different ambitions of what they want to get from being there. You know, there'll be the people that want to do, and then there'll be the people that want to, um, yeah, go through a process more. Yeah, it seems, and and that that might generate different energies and different wants that create. Yeah, and, and I can imagine that doing that these five minutes slots that we have here can actually solve that problem, because one person can go into solving the problem, and the other person can uh, do their process, uh, but everybody gets their time so it won't be some person going into their feelings and you know and the other person feeling impatient because they're only talking about their feelings and yeah I can imagine that this process can really balance that out mm. yeah thank you yeah so you you're thinking actually this method can Quite, be quite good at solving that problem because using it you know every person has their own time and so even if one person wants to go into the feelings and wants to go into that sort of things and the other one's very action oriented and wants to talk about those things they all get to talk about what they want and so it, it satisfies every it satisfies everyone's needs potentially as a method yeah and nobody can go on for too long also yeah and yeah. no 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 one can go on for too long <laughs> thank you i feel hurt thank you uh david will you listen to me so yes to all of the above <laughs> um, there are some things that were coming up throughout. Uh, one was, I don't think it, it's something that can't be overcome, but I, I do know people in my personal, and I think we all do, that would struggle to do active listening. Um, and would struggle to be willing to think about doing active listening because it, even if we were here talking about very intellectual uh, things and not you know doing all the different layers but just purely political debate it still demands a degree of vulnerability that some people it might change, but there will be resistance there, and they might end up feeling ostracized, um, excluded, as if though the method itself was made so as to exclude them. So, what I hear you saying is that this discussion is fruitful for you but you you worry or consider that there are people that would not find it congenial they would resist it because it requires a certain amount of vulnerability and because they are not able or willing to go into that they would feel excluded and you know i'm thinking my dad for example like it's not you know he's a loving person but he's just very self-focused um, and he has a lot to contribute. Like, he, you know, he likes to talk and he makes sense, but he wouldn't really, I think, at first anyway, be able 
to reflect back. It would take a lot of trial and error. And I think he'd probably do it in, you know, in a personal context, but I don't know if he'd be willing to do that in a public context. You know, yeah. So your father is not skilled at listening perhaps, or in any case is self-focused and he might be able to engage in empathic listening on a personal way, but in a public process, he, he wouldn't do that. Yeah. And so thinking there's many like him. Um, so yeah, so that came up for me. And then another thread was the practicalities. You know, earlier you were talking about how do we get enough people and can they handle the load that are able to facilitate how many of them do we need? What kinds of skills do we need? All of that. And thinking, you know, what is that is missing? I think definitely the people with, that are willing are out there, right? And, and anyone can upskill if they're willing. Um, so it's down to the supports of like the elders elders of any age, but the people, you know, like Edwin that are there and that know, um, so to have those supports and then having the very practical financial supports because we still live in, you know, so that you, you don't need to worry about, am I going to have a roof and am I going to have food? And so if your expenses are covered, then you can actually throw yourself into being a such facilitator and then having the community to do that with. So you worry about the practicalities, uh, but you feel like there are people who are willing to do it. It's a matter of support system and wisdom from elders of any age. And then people who might be willing still face the constraints of making a living. And I'm very inspired by Edwin's work and so many others like, you know, earlier I was talking about Miki Kashtan who uses, she comes from an NVC, a very deep NVC background from nonviolent communication. You know, she's like one of the nonviolent communication gurus, but then she took it that step further to this, um, uh, to this convergent facilitation where instead of using, you know, a three day process, like Edwin was saying, she did some videos online, she just, short circuits the whole thing by directly getting the needs out of people in a very quick sort of way um yeah i want to read more on that but anyway miki kashtan also is a person that i think we can all learn from so, so you've identified a particular expert uh, a wise woman who has made strides in making this effective and you want to know more about her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan. Sophia. Yes. Listen. I heard you talk. I'm sorry. Yeah. I heard you talking about uh, the time and the patience that's required to make this work. And I think that's a, an important point. People can use action as a way to avoid feelings and can, can waste their time and their life energy, can waste their love in pursuing things that are not fruitful. We all do it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes and one has to explore. That's the one thing about time and patience. The other is I myself have a, have a moment of absolute terror every time I do this. When I see the big group and it's like, we're going to breakout rooms now. And I'm like, oh no, who am I going to talk to? And is it going to, are they going to be friendly? And are they going to accept me? And this will be interesting. 
I freak out every time. And then every time after I let myself settle in, listen and appreciate, I feel at home and I'm grateful I get to meet people. Mm. So, so um, the first thing that you mentioned was the, the taking time and that people who are very um, action, solution uh, oriented, they, they sort of meet, miss the deeper, deeper layers of, of life. That's what I'm hearing. And, and also uh, connecting with themselves. Um, and, and the second part was about you feeling really nervous when, when, when going into these circles. And yeah, when, when you, it seems like when you realize the pace that this is going to, you sort of settle down into, yeah, um, and, and you feel relaxed again. Yeah. When I started this kind of work last year, March of last year, or April, I thought I was really smart. I thought I knew a lot because I've been studying, you know, disaster all my life. And then I showed up at the Deep Adaptation Facebook group and there were hundreds of people smarter than me, wiser than me, have been studying it for years, have complete understanding of bodies of knowledge that I didn't even know existed, like permaculture, for example. I didn't know permaculture. So it has been diving into an unfamiliar lake or ocean and then being surrounded by a pod of dolphins and we're all friendly and happy together and now I'm a dolphin. <laughs> so if you give it some time, you meet, you meet people. And that I think is, that's what we are all trying to do. That's why we're here. That's what these are about, these meetings. Yeah. So it seems like you're, you're still on this, uh, let it take time. Uh, when, when you first started this out, you, you had the idea of you being really smart. And when, when going into um, the adaptation, didn't uh, understand adaptation? The Facebook group, yeah. Yeah. Um, you realized that there were, yeah, a lot, lot of people that were just as smart and even smarter than you. And, and just sort of like diving into this and yeah let it take time that that's what i'm hearing from you uh, yes and it's very difficult sometimes because everything feels so urgent you look around there's suffering on every side and fear and worry about the future and you're like, oh my, I got to do something. I've got to say something. I've got to be something. I've got to, I, I have to, I have to, I have to. If you, if you jump from a, from, a, from a bad foundation, you're just going to hurt yourself. You're not going to get anywhere and you're just going to hurt yourself. Uh, so it takes a while to figure out even where you are and, and what you're doing. And I noticed that XR, they just issued, three people just issued a pamphlet that's about rushing things. I haven't had the chance to read it yet. But uh, the idea of the, the pacing of things is uh, in the face of what appears to be tremendous urgency is really an, a, a, an important question. Mm. So you're seeing the conflict between these uh, world um, uh, 
there's an urgent urgency to to saving the planet basically and also allowing things to take time and there's a you see a conflict there and you 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 i i hear some kind of questioning how do we let it take time but also realize that it is urgent is that what i'm hearing yes and finally um i think we we are collectively we are on the the frontier of what we know how to do and it takes courage to stand at the frontier and to take another step into unknown territory. So Edmund, I thank you again for uh, convening this event happening place where we can find courage with each other to step into unknown territory. Yes, you're, you're feeling appreciation and thankfulness for this platform and you also acknowledge the courage that we in this community have in, in letting it take time doing this work and uh, yeah you feel thankful for that yeah thank you i feel heard thank you i need 30 seconds away and i'll be right back i am listening uh edwin mm, listening uh, i just realized that i wanted to pick david but and because he hasn't listened to me but no, uh -huh. the next time um he's back if you like i can accommodate you no yeah. problem yeah i'm ready listening mm. I, I really enjoyed the, the depth, depth, depth uh, of what you're talking about. Uh, and I, I, I agree uh, with what you're saying. I, I think that if we, if we just follow this impulse on that it's urgent, um i i think we might be we might be creating solutions that aren't very good in the long run you like looking a little deeper because you feel that if we go too fast we might come up with solutions that are not going to work in the long in the long term yeah Yeah, I, I, I just really enjoyed listening to you. And I feel that I don't have a lot of things to say anymore, except that, yeah, now Martha went away, but I really want to know the person that she, um, I really want the name because I want to look her up. Um, did you hear that, Martha? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, because that's what I've been thinking also, that when, when, we're, when we get used to this, that's just my vision, that when we get used to this listening, um, because we're not, we're not used to this listening and, and figuring out what needs and values we, ha we have, I think that eventually it's it's going to go at a faster pace because we're so out of touch with ourselves, most of us. Well, I hear you returning to your thoughts about needs and values and that if we can get to those fundamental connections between people, then we'll be able to make progress at a faster pace in a way that 
will, will really get traction, be valuable. Yeah, and, and I'm mainly talking about self connection because I, I don't I don't think a lot of people are are even aware of what their needs and values are. Most people just live and watch commercials and act on that. But I think a lot of people are living outside of their own values, not knowing what their values are even. And so self-connection. -connect and I, I, I think that doing these processes can, and just connecting with yourself, um, yeah. That, that's you're talking about the issue of self connection and self knowledge and lamenting the truth that many people nowadays apparently are not in touch with themselves they don't know what they value they don't know what they need they're involved in commercial society something else and so this process can help self-connection and self-knowledge. Yeah, and, and that's a thing that I've, I've noticed with me personally, that when I, I really figured out what my values are, it's, it's much easier to make decisions. Uh, I, I was in a, a circling group for a while, and and I actually noticed that people weren't empathic there. They were just reacting on what they were feeling. They weren't listening. And just by knowing that empathy is a really high value for me, I just could make that decision very quickly that, no, this is not for me. Um, so so, And I, I, I don't think I would have done that without knowing what my values are. So you were involved in a, in a failed experiment or you saw people engaging in what looked to you like a failed process. And because you are in touch with your own values, you were able to identify that and then take action on your own behalf. Mm. Yeah, thank you, I feel heard. You were almost there for going to the main group. If you want to do a, I guess we could just uh, open it up for, I'm kind of taking over facilitation. <laughs> Sorry, Martha. Um, uh, just, I just want to appreciate everyone and just any sort of maybe open comments for a minute or two, just before we go back. Quick. Hi. I'd, I'd quickly like, so I'll send, I, I took both of your emails down, Sophia and David, and I'll send you the materials I was talking about. Yes. Um, I just also want to name uh, Sarah Payton. So yeah. she, she, she does trauma work. And so there's an interview with her and Mickey Kashtan um, on, oh. yeah, uh, on, on, you know, because there's also, because you mentioned needs and values, and then there's triggers, yeah. which is another thing that we need to know about ourselves and mm. others, because in the absence of knowing about triggers, which most people don't know, even if they know needs and values, they don't know about triggers. So I just wanted to add that in. Sarah Payton, what's the process? Um, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link. Okay, I put yeah, it in the document. Easier. There's a list here in the doc in the shared document that uh, it has Mickey, she, Rosa, et cetera, et cetera, put it in there. Yeah, I think she's more trauma informed than than uh, NBC and uh, she she great. knows also all the neuroscience, so she explains the neuroscience yeah. of triggers and yeah. all that. Okay, so I'm going to hit the, uh, let me see the breakout room. It's going to close the room. So we've got about 60 seconds before we're thrown into the, uh, brought back into the main group. So you can hit the return yeah. to main session or it'll automatically I, I, bring you. Yeah, just want to appreciate David again. Like it's a pleasure. Um, yeah. Very refreshing, very refreshing. Um, Energy. You know,
energy and a different kind of in a way it's what i'm looking for it's this kind of thinking where we don't we acknowledge all the feelings it's not like not, we're not talking about them they're there but there's all these other things as well it's like how do we bring both yeah and uh Hey, welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good talk in the other group. I enjoyed ours. And uh, so, what we wanted to do now was to uh, get a bit of uh, feedback. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, just it, for sort of harvesting sort of any sort of positive uh, stories or feelings or experiences about the empathy circle maybe we can go around and just you know in 30 seconds or so just share maybe what you liked about the uh, empathy circle or you know just anything about your experience um, uh, and then we'll go around do one round of that and then do the second round uh, we'll do it about the uh, any sort of uh, feed, not just kind of what you came up with, sort of an outline of uh, any insights from from your group. But we'll start with uh, first. What is uh, so? What was your experience? Maybe Bill could go around and just select people, uh, just make, almost like testimonials. You know, what did you like? Let's start with what you liked, just to uh, kind of harvest that for you know any kind of promotion or whatever. You know, sure. On, okay. Maybe. All right, uh, Sophia, would you start, please? Uh, yeah, what I like about the, the empathy, empathy circles, uh, I like a lot. <laughs> nice. um, uh, I'm exploring kind of the, the depth, 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 oh my God, I can't say that word. Um, the depth, depth, <laughs> sorry. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> That, that you can go into in doing these empathy circles. I think in the beginning when you start doing them, it's somewhat shallow. Uh, but as you get used to the method, I'm, I'm re rarely nervous when I go into these empathy circles nowadays. I just feel very relaxed and then you can explore deeper layers. So yeah, I just enjoy everything about the these circles great thanks lou you know i i always enjoy um meeting new people and i met uh, several new people in this circle and and by meeting them i don't mean just superficially but when people are taking time to talk about things that are important to them what matters to them uh, you get to know them at a at a deeper level, or you begin to do that. And 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 we didn't have enough rounds in our circle to get really deep, but I I did begin to really understand people and like what was important to them. And that's always um, um, I, I that feels connecting to me, and and I enjoy that. I enjoy uh, connecting with people that way. Great, thanks, Lou. Carolina. I like the moments when somebody surprises me with new ideas that never came to me, to my mind. I love that moment. It's kind of moment, aha moment, uh, but kind of aha moment triggered by other people. So I like this moment. Uh, and the other thing I like is to meet people around all of, over the, the the globe and suddenly get familiar with them it's short uh, we we know each other very shortly but i knew something about them and they knew they know something about me this is kind of 
warm, I would say, warm. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carolina. Marta? Uh, it's always lovely meeting new people. Um, I was a bit sad I didn't get to be in the circle with Elsie. I was quite excited about mm -hmm. that, but maybe another time. Um, yeah, I'm inspired about, you know, this method is amazing. Uh, and I was thinking, one thing that was triggered for myself is how can, how can I sustain myself to become a facilitator? You know, is a, because there seems to be a need for it. So how, yeah, that's what I'm left with. Thank you, Marta. Um, I'll see this. Well, uh, I like very much that this uh, sort of rigid rule let everybody speak uh, very easily. The the word come, goes from one to another, and it's something that is difficult when you do not have this um, clear rules. So there is sort of dispute for the word now. I like this, uh, make it easy. People who are more shy uh, are going to start speaking. So this is what I like very much. Thank you very much. David. I really enjoyed uh, learning a new procedure. I think the specificity of how it runs is an advantage. Uh, first time I've ever experienced it. So. I look forward to learning more. And it's great to meet new folks. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, Mary, can you hear us? OK. OK, I did it. Um, I very much enjoy practicing because, as Steve and our group said, it's not familiar to listen. In our Santa Fe group, everyone has ideas, many, many ideas, but to listen it's a skill that's essential in our future and now. So I appreciated practicing with all of you. Thank you, Mary. You're Feelings welcome. mutual. Um, all right, Steve. Uh, yes, uh, I appreciate that, Mary. I guess the idea is that we all, it sounds like we all appreciate a, a structure, uh, a protocol, rather than the kitchen table everybody's talking at the same time that we're all used to or at least we were brought up in many cases that way everybody talking nobody listening and how to get out of that so the idea of empathic listening uh, active listening is is a step in the right direction and if we can explain it to other people in an easy facilitative way then that would be a good thing Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, Sally. Can you hear us, Sally? There you go, okay. Okay, um, yeah, this has been a, a great um, learning experience. Um, even though I've participated in this before, um, I, um, think that the method and its structure enables, I mean, I don't like that word, but it allows um, listening at a higher um, capability and along with um, neutrality between um, different types of people. I think we can um, make some, we can um, go far. That's what I think. Thank you, Sally. Okay. Um, and I'll check out. Um, I really like um, uh, the practice and, and, as Lou said, getting to know people, especially I am monolingual 
And so I just want to express my appreciation for people who are actually English as a second language or, and are coming out and reaching out. And I feel enriched because you did that. So I like the format. I love the format. Uh, I think it's effective, but I also like what each individual brings um, to the format that makes it unique. Thanks. Okay. Edwin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for me, it's uh, one thing is I like that I don't have to compete to be heard. Uh, so that kind of relaxes me. Like I know I'm going to have my time and it was, I'm really bad at sort of like sometimes in finding the, the space to speak into a group. And this is like, you know, I know I have my time to, to be uh, heard and uh, that feels good as well as the feeling of the enrichment. Like there's, I feel like my world is enriched uh, just by, especially with, when there's new people, I get this uh, deeper, a uh, sort of field of uh, feelings and thoughts and and sort of sort of expands my world so i really appreciate that so the next um part we want to go through again uh, around uh for from each person is sort of your uh reporting back from your group uh you know what were the sort of the points that were that you felt were important uh from your group uh so a bit of a, just a short, you know, one minute, a report from everyone about what came up in your group, what were kind of salient for you, and especially about creating the, facil the uh, facilitators network. I don't know how much you talked about that or about, um, you know, about the kind of tangible steps that you want to take next in creating a, a facilitators network. So, uh, and again, Bill, if you'd be willing to just, kind of call on people to give a minute or so to just report back? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I'm just going around my screen. So, um, so Sophia, we'll start with you again then. Uh, yes, there was, the things that were standing out for me was um, when the, the, the empathy circle isn't enough, and sort of like brainstorming and actually coming up with a solution. And I think that was a, an interesting conversation. And also uh, that, that doing the, the active listening and really listening to people, that, that takes time. And um, uh, we have to, yeah, we have to sort of land in that, that it takes more time than just uh, coming up with quick solutions. Uh, that really stuck with me. Okay, and Lou? Um, so I'm not sure that I would say, and others in my group may feel differently, I, I'm not sure that I would, that I can identify a lot of concrete ideas that we came up with there uh, there was a lot of expression around um the need for listening and listening is an important tool to create understanding and to understand different points of view and to bring people together um every, uh, i think there was a lot of expressing around that that was important and that tools like the empathy circle seemed to be like a good tool for doing that um I I uh, I said that uh, I thought that doing this work of training and practicing, and and having a chance to reflect on that practice over time, are important elements of building facilitators with a lot of capacity. So I think that that's a one concrete thing that I can think of, and maybe others will will remember other things. I also just want to make a comment that that. Um, you know, one of the things about the first time that you do this, or the first few times that you do this, is that if you participate in an empathy circle for a short amount of time, and it's a new experience, uh, people generally experience frustration with it when they first start, because it's much slower than they usually are conversing, and it's also, people are not used to reflecting back, so they're learning how to do that, and maybe they struggle with doing that. And so early on in your experience of empathy circles, 
a lot of people experience just frustration and kind of like even, I'm not sure about this process. This seems kind of slow and stupid to me. And it isn't until you've participated in it for a while, like maybe an hour, a good hour or two, that you start to feel the positive effects of uh, getting clarity yourself about what is important to you and what you want to say and understanding others at kind of a deep level. The conversation drops into a deep level. And so I always fear when someone ex people are experiencing it for the first time and they only get a short amount of time doing it, that they're going to form the judgment that, you know, this process really doesn't work and it's kind of uh, uncomfortable. I wasn't hearing that from the people in my circle, but I always just want to say it. And that uh, if you are have questions about it, please participate more. You know, get at least a few hours under your belt before you make a decision about it because I've done conflict resolution and communication for a long time. And this process, if you participate in it, for a while is a very powerful process. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Lou. Carolina? Um, I actually came with some kind of constatation I have that empathy circle, empathic listening and Speaking because I see both those activities, empathic listening and empathic speaking, uh, are integral part of colocracy or soci sociocracy. Uh, without that, colocracy doesn't work, horizontal structure of organization will not work and obviously if we have hierarchical system um, it's possible that some bosses CEOs try to be empathic and try to hear their uh, uh, personal stuff working for them but the system that is hierarchical doesn't require empathy requires following orders demands uh, when holacracy sociocracy requires this ability to hear each other and uh, that's what i took from this today circle for me at least, that was my discovery. Something quite obvious, but you have to realize that. Great, thanks Carolina. Marta? There's various things we spoke of. We spoke of empathy cycles because of its structure and being so simple, it could, be easy, it could easily go viral. Um, and and it's a method that could you know be useful in so many ways with minimal investment and then we spoke of the importance of identifying needs values and maybe also triggers in oneself and you know as part of going deeper uh, we've discussed very briefly, but what would it take, you know, importance of building this network of facilitators and need that we're going to need for the future? How many people do we need? You know, are they going to handle the load? All of that. And so we spoke of map, the importance of mapping a route or a route, you know, how, how do we mapping that? And so I'm interested going forward in finding more people that want to do that thinking. Because, yeah. And it might be that it's not just XR, maybe it's across various different groups, and maybe we're just not doing that thinking together yet. Um, so, and we spoke of the practicalities, and, and also that as being in these situations, we meet hordes of people, and they make us reevaluate our worthiness. Like, we might have thought that we know everything, uh, and then we see so many people that know so much and we go a bit, ooh, maybe I'm a bit smaller. And so that a bit of that came up as well. Um, 
and, and a lot else, but I'll stop here. Thank you, Marta. I'll see this. Uh, it was the first time I took part in um, this kind of meeting and for me it was uh, what the first thing that came to my mind is that the, the, the topic properly was not uh, developed, uh, we did not have time to go to it, we, uh, we would need more time because it was it's just enough to uh, sort of know each other and what are our uh, interests uh, around this issue, the topic. But uh, maybe uh, when the same group we do it more time, uh, then you can develop it deeper, uh, the topic. And this is what uh, I guess Lou was trying to say. And well, I liked it very much, and I, I believe it, uh, it can work for me. Uh, but for now, I see it really takes time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. David? I was impressed most with the insight that Sophia had about the importance of needs and values, and that beneath the discussion of strategy and the contention about alternative paths is the foundation of needs and values and triggers Marta also mentioned. This led sort of in the course of our discussion to the idea that self-knowledge, self-connection is an important achievement of using this method. That in order to make proper decisions on behalf of yourself and others, in order to properly have relationships with others that are honest and fruitful, you need, you need to know yourself and you need to know the needs and values from which you are operating and the triggers that can set you off and interfere with communication. So the idea that this method can lead to self-knowledge, self-connection, which then enables the reaching out to others is a fairly significant insight from today, I think. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Mary? Can you hear us, Mary? Yes. Oh, okay, I finally got it. Um, I'm so sorry that I couldn't get on for the first part, a good part of the beginning, so I didn't really know the topic other than we were supposed to practice listening and responding without any judgments, just the usual. But I feel that this, what I got from this meeting just further entrenches the idea that in order for us to evolve as people it's really essential to practice this as we go about our days too and the examples for extinction rebellion that we can change because if we can't even do it with so much practice um i've had more practice than some of you it's um it's exciting to change. It's wonderful to change. So I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry that I missed the beginning. Thank you, Mary. Um, let's see. Steve? I know things have shifted, so I, I hope I'm not calling you twice. Uh, no, I haven't spoken yet. Okay, good. Uh, it just seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, because the topic was facilitator network, um, I don't think we spoke as much along those lines about what role the facilitator network would be or what, I mean, it it's kind of implies that hey, we need people to go out and improve the quality of discussion around climate change. But 
I see that almost in any type of topic, not just climate change, although that seems to be the most pressing or most important, of course. But um, I guess I, so I'm, I'm pointing out in, in our discussion, I didn't hear uh, stories. Uh, and I think the relationship that we, in creating relationships between all of us, storytelling is one way for us to connect and say, tell a story and you say, that happened to me too. And then there's a connection there. So I heard one time that somebody described democracy as organized storytelling, where people go, come together, they tell their stories and they try to make sense of what to do. So I would, I, I would like to hear more story, more connection, more storytelling and how a facilitator's network is envisioned, even if it's just a proposal to put out on the table and kick around. Okay, are you done, Steve? Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's all right, oh, that's fine. Just wanted to make sure you got fully heard. Okay, and finally, uh, well, Sally, not finally, Sally. Sally, can you hear us? There you go. Hi. Okay. okay, hi. Hi. Um, well, I have a lot of ideas out there, um, but I think we have to just start with the essentials um, from the very beginning. And um, I, I kind of see um, some different things going on in the um, progression <clears throat> to a uh, larger uh, arena um, as in uh, working with these other climate um, <clears throat> activist organizations to get them um, <clears throat> basically carrying the torch on with people in uh, our country and other countries, um, that might be a way to go. Um, as for today, I think the ideas that were presented, um, it was, you know, maybe um, something that we missed, but something that we gained. Um, and I, um, I, I think we just, you know, need to document it and, you know, have it in writing and then kind of um, build a structure for um, at least, uh, I don't know, um, what do you call it, like a, a pilot project? of sorts where it's um you know actually um implemented and that maybe that's what our first um objective is so i don't know i didn't talk about today but that's how i look at it okay great all right um i'll go i was um I was struck by the need that people have, I think, to work as an effective team. As I see, I see the bu building of the XR as sort of a, a young group. Um, and I actually, in my job, I worked in a hospital for suicidal adolescents and also kids in crisis. So it demanded um, excellent cooperation. Now we didn't agree on everything, like people talk about, but when it came to what the task was at hand, a list of priorities, um, I could depend upon them and they could depend upon me. And this is, you know, taking into account um, physical danger. So it's very important to build that trust, especially in that um, context. Um, so I was, again, uh, really impressed. I can see the beginning of this team building. I can feel the need for it. And um, I would, as far as building a facilitator's network, I hope to enable it. Thanks. Edwin. Okay, thanks, uh, Bill. So uh, 
our topic of uh, creating a facilitators network, you know, we're just basically sort of tapping into that. That was sort of the gateway uh, discussion uh, for this. And, you know, we didn't go too deeply into it in, in our uh, group. We uh, talked about the empathy circle as sort of a foundational practice and kind of other directions uh, is it that, that can other practices that build on it or that you can go create that pathway of different uh, democracy building or relationship building practices. Uh, I, one of the other groups, someone said, well, we didn't go into it really deeply, you know, into how to create that facilitators network. But part of it here was just to get an experience with the empathy circle. And like Lou says, it, it take, I, I find about two hours is a really good time in a small group to do an empathy circle. The first hour, you're gonna get kind of familiar with the practice, sink into it, and then, you have sort of a deeper uh, experience and and it's really, really a lifelong experience to deepen that uh, listening and empathic speaking. Um, let's see, we have, uh, if you're interested in facilitating, if you have some practices, you can facilitate that through the Future Democracy Hub. And you can contact uh, Paul and some of the others that are contact me and you can actually host your own uh, process. So um, that's like, and then they have good distribution uh, in terms of getting the word out because uh, they're, it's co-hosted with uh, UK, uh, XR UK and uh, XR London and sometimes with the full network. So it's a good way to get your practices out there if you have any uh, democracy building practices. Uh, we have, um, Next Friday, we have another cafe, and it's going to be about using the same process, using uh, on the topic of how do we address conflict. So it's one application of the empathy circle practice. So we'll be doing that. And on February 12th, we'll be doing another uh, one of these. And uh, I think that's it then for this. I had thought we had a 30 minute overtime, but that was, we, Last time we had like 32 people, we needed that extra time to, you know, kind of hear everyone. So I think we can just do the two hours. We don't need that over time. So, and I can stay a little bit here if anybody wants to kind of hang out and, uh, and uh, chat. And so, you know, thank you everybody for taking part. Uh, the videos will be, uh, did, you, did you record okay, uh, Lou? Did that recording work? So we'll be posting the videos and I'll send you a, a link uh, to that and you can you know sp spread the word. I did some documentation in this Google Doc. If you feel inspired, you know you can go into that Google Doc and you know, I'll put the link in again. And if you want to be able to connect with others in the group, go into the Google Doc and you can see their email address and stuff like that. And so you know keep the connection going. You know hope to see you in future empathy circles and thank you so much for taking part everyone you can stop recording yeah